are doing is better than and transcends maybe even what we see in front of our faces. Lord, we pray this morning as we open your word, we invite you to speak. Lord, we open our hearts to you. And Lord, I pray that this word of hope would speak volumes to us. Those who have gathered here, Lord, we pray that you would meet us right where we are. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat if you'd like. Well, this, uh, this past week, just a few nights ago, we were home doing something that I'm, frankly, uh, due to all this stuff, sick of. The TV was on. And there's not really a lot of good sports on to watch, so frankly, I just don't care uh, about uh, that. I, I'm, I'm kind of sick of it. I remember you know, a few weeks ago, back when, when we were sick and quarantined, and so I thought I was going to lose my ever-loving mind. I was pacing through the house. I just wanted out, 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 sick of all of that, that kind of stuff. But the other night, we, we kind of scrolled through. And do you, have, do you have these movies where if you see it, no matter, you've seen it a hundred times. But if you see it, you can't stop. You have to watch it one more time. That, that happened again. We were, so we ended up watching the last half of a movie that I've seen a hundred times. And at the end of it, we end up in a discussion amongst the family of kind of going through and picking, naming your top five movies of all time. And so we're going through that. And shockingly, one of the movies that kept coming back to my list is something you would probably never think of. And it's one of those movies that as, uh, you know, we're starting a new series this morning uh, as, as we look at Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. Um, and it's a small little, little church. And it, it just reminded me of this connection to one of my top five all-time movies. Anybody got a guess what it might be? You can't guess because you wouldn't know. But it's an animated movie. It's Cars. I, I, Cars is one of my all-time favorite movies. As, and, and the more, you know, it, it kept coming up on the list, and I was like, no, I can't put a movie like that in my top five. And yet, over and over, I kept trying to shove it down, and it kept coming back up into the list again and again and again. The fact is, as I was studying and reading through Colossians and, and, and looking to start this, this new series, I realized that Cars, the movie Cars, and the Paul's letter to the church in Colossae have a lot in common. In fact, Colossae has a lot in common with Radiator Springs. Now, if you remember the movie, if you remember the story of Cars, Radiator Springs is this old town that has been bypassed by bigger and better, new and improved interstates and highways. And so the old, uh, the old town that used to be on the main thoroughfare that people would travel is now dying dead, and it's searching for meaning. It's searching for purpose. It's searching for hope. It's searching for a reason to continue its, its existence because it's been bypassed and forgotten. The fact is that's exactly what we're dealing with with the town of Colossae. Colossae was one time a thriving town. It was on the major trade route through Asia Minor, but lo and behold, the Romans came in, and the Romans were great road builders. And the Romans built a grand, new, bigger and better road. And guess what? Colossae got bypassed. And suddenly, this town that once used to be a thriving place of trade and commerce found itself bypassed, left behind, and struggling for its identity and purpose. Now, 
if you've ever seen the movie. Okay, we'll do it this way. Who has not seen the movie? Yeah, nobody, everybody's too embarrassed. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Everybody's seen the movie then. I, I'll, I'll take it that. You know, he, he, the, the fact is this. I enjoy driving through small towns. I, I, I love getting off the interstate and traveling and driving through small town America. And, and I love going through these old small towns and, and envisioning, man, what must it been like in this town's heyday. You drive through small towns throughout Ohio that at one time had a, a thriving business, that at one time it had a factory, it, it, it produced something, it did something, and it no longer does because a bigger and better, more efficient, or more economically, uh, uh, financially rewarding uh, means came along or it got shipped over to China or whatever it is and that thing that used to drive this community is no longer there and these towns are just struggling to survive. But I kind of go back in my mind and I wonder, man, what must it have been like when this town was thriving and in its heyday and was, had, had financial viability to it and all that? I, I, I'm just captivated by that. Not only that, but when we look at the town of, of Colossae, and as Paul writes this, this letter to this new fledgling church, we realize that there's a lot going on there. Colossae is a mixed bag of people. It, it, it's a town that, that's made up of, of Jewish people and Greeks and Phrygians, and now this, you know, because it used to, at one time, it was a major on the trade route. So there, there, there was a lot of mixed groups of people. And now you've got different people from different economic backgrounds, different, different uh, religious backgrounds, different um, ethnic backgrounds, all coming together and many of them embracing this good news message of Jesus. And now they're becoming a part of this, this new people of God. But they're so different. And now they've got to figure out how do we live as the people of God even though we come from such varied and diverse backgrounds. And that's what Paul is, is writing to. Now, not only that, but you factor in, in Colossae. If, if you, you notice in, in Colossians 4.9 and in the book of Philemon uh, chapter 10, there's another big issue that takes place. In Colossae. See, Colossae is the home of Philemon and Onesimus. So, in the same church now, you've got a former slave master and a freed slave who have both embraced the good news message of Jesus and now find themselves as brothers. What do you do? With this new thing, when, when people who once were master and slave now are brothers. And so you've got all of these dynamics going on. You know, when we read the New Testament, we, we've got to remember that we are not trying to get back to some pure form of church. When we read the New Testament, we're reading new groups of Christians trying to figure it out. Trying to figure out what does it mean to be the people of God even though we've got all of these barriers, even we've got all of these differences, what are we supposed to do with that? And so Paul writes to help this young church in Colossae to learn to live in and to live out their new identity in Christ. They've embraced this message of the good news of Jesus Christ. But now what does that mean? And at the beginning of, of, of his letter, in verses 1 through 8, I want us to notice just a few things. So let's read together Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And then we're just going to kind of make a few observations of, of, of kind of what it means to be an ordinary Christian trying to figure this stuff out. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, 
grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it, is all, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister or servant of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Now, it's the introduction to a letter, and we might look at an introduction to a letter and say there's not much there, but there's so much, much here that it, we could take forever to unpack all of this, so we're not going to. So I, I just kind of want to make three brief observations this morning that maybe encourage us. The, the first thing is this. The Christian faith is always relational in nature. The Christian faith is always relational in nature. I want you to notice all of the plural pronouns and references at the beginning of, of this letter. And, and, and notice this at the very beginning. It's not just Paul saying, hey, Paul's got this all figured out and Paul is writing to this church. It's Paul, what? And Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy is also writing to them. The references continue. Verse 3 and on. We always thank God when we pray since we heard of your faith on down toward the end Epaphras our beloved fellow servant he is a faithful servant of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love notice it's always plural not only that from from the Paul and Timothy and 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 the kind of the leadership team side of thing but on the other side, when he's writing to the people in Colossae, he's not writing just to individuals. Notice it begin in verse 2, to the saints, plural, and faithful brothers and sisters, plural. Grace to you. Now, notice every time in this whole passage, every time you see the word you, it's yuns or y'all. Okay? It's you, plural. It's not singular. He's talking to a group. Why? Because the church is us having to figure it out together. And so on and on. I, I, I've circled all of those in just these first eight verses. When we pray for you all, since we heard of your all's faith in Jesus Christ and the love that you all have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you all. Of this you all have heard of before, the gospel which has come to you all in the whole world. It is bearing fruit and increasing as it, is all, as it also does among you all since the day you all heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you all learned it from Epaphras, our beloved minister of Christ, on your all's behalf and has made known to you all us you're all love over and over and over again. It's plural, plural, plural. We are writing to you all. It's not an individualistic thing. Not only that, but if you notice throughout the entire passage, just these eight verses, you get the unpacking of the Trinity. God, three in one. There's references over and over to Jesus Christ, God. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, Christ Jesus, God, Christ, and at the very end, the Spirit. Even God exists in His essence in perfect relationship. We call this, this we thing church. Everything about this Christian faith is relational. In nature, 
It's not just an individualistic thing. Me and Jesus, Jesus and me are nowhere to be found. It's always a we relational thing. You know, we, we just kind of came out of Christmas and all that that uh, entails. And we sing songs and we've got in our imagination because we are of a Western civilization culture, you know, we, we kind of have a way of reading the Christmas story. And there was a, a, an awesome article that I read a, a few years ago that contrasted the way we in the West read and tell the Christmas story versus the way people say in Africa or the Middle East read and tell the Christmas story. And one of the things it shows is just how we fill in the gaps with our assumptions and our individualistic Worldview. You know, when we think of the Christmas story, we, we picture it and we've got what? Mary and Joseph and Jesus out in a barn in the middle of nowhere by themselves, right? That's the way we tell the story. Why? Because there was no room in the inn. So there was no room, so they have to go out to the middle of nowhere all by themselves. Well, people in Africa and the Middle East begin to ask certain questions. Well, who, gave, who, who, who birthed the baby? Certainly not Joseph. That would never happen in that culture. But we just assume that it's what? Like we, mom, dad, and a kid. When we travel, most of the time, what do we do? It's parents and, and kids. It's our family unit, the nuclear family. But that's not at all how anyone in the Middle East or Africa or most of the other parts of the world would ever do it. In fact, we imagine Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem, what, by themselves, right? Traveling, it's just the two of them going down the road. It's a lonely, quiet night. They finally get to town. They drag in. The inns are all full. There's nowhere to go, so they have to go find a barn somewhere. No, no one from a Middle Eastern or African or other perspective would ever assume that any couple would travel on their own in that territory. You just didn't do it. In fact, in Luke chapter 2, when Jesus was 12 years old, remember there's a story, how are the people traveling? Remember when Jesus gets lost and his family can't find him? Why couldn't they find him? Why did They just assumed after they got out of town that he was where? That he was in the caravan somewhere. Why? Because that's how you traveled. It was too dangerous. Nobody traveled on their own, by themselves, couple, nuclear family or anything like that. So when we read the story, we read the story with these individualistic eyes. But the Bible was written from such a vastly different culture. It was written from a we culture. But we think in such a me culture. A, a, a me-centered, individualistic way that so often we miss so much. One of the things that we've got to remember, though, is that the Christian faith is always, always corporate, relational in nature. It's not just an individualistic me kind of thing. Second and flowing out of this is this. The, the, the next observation I want to want to make and want us to kind of see here this morning is this: these relationships tell stories. These relationships tell stories, and we see these stories bit by bit in the passage that, that we read this morning. First of all, I want to look at two components of story. First is meta story. Now, meta that means Small, the small little stories. In this case, notice what you see in, in this passage. The, the, the small story, the, in, the, the, the kind of group, it surrounds Colossi story. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we, when we pray for you, since we heard of what? We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. 
because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you. As indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful servant of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Notice what Paul's talking about. He's talking about, I have heard about your love and your faith and your hope. Paul writes about this quite a bit, faith, hope, and love, right? But it's not just a formula. He mixes it up here. It's not in the faith, hope, and love formulaic way. He talks about their love and their, their, their faith and their love and their hope. And he says, I hear that these three things, they're coming to life in your midst. I've heard about it. Epaphras, our brother, has told us about what he observes in seeing in your lives happening in this unlikely yet very ordinary group of those who seem to have been bypassed by the always bigger and better. These people in Colossae feel that they've lost their sense of purpose. They've lost their identity and yet they found this newfound faith and it's impacted their lives and there is life transformation, life change going on so much so that Paul and others are hearing about it. They're hearing about what's going on. Now faith is not merely the way we use faith these days. You know, these days we hear people on TV or athletes or what say, you know, well, we, we, you just got to believe. We, we just had to have faith. Well, faith in what? Typically what they mean is well, you just got to have some sort of belief that we can, whatever that is. But that's not what Paul's talking about when he talks about faith. He's talking about, about faith. He talks about specifically here, your faith in Christ Jesus, what God has done for you, the grace that God has shown for you in Christ Jesus. It's a personal trust and it's a personal belief that certain things are true. It's not just this belief in belief itself. It's a belief that certain things are true, that certain things have happened, that God has intervened and God has done something. So it's a very specific faith. Not only that, but he says, we've heard about your love for all. That's an important word, all the saints. Think about this, this group that has been thrown together. Slave owner and slave, different ethnic backgrounds. And the story that's being told is you guys are learning how to love one another. That's a powerful story. And it's gaining, it's gaining ground. And it's becoming a story that's getting told over and over. And he talks about hope, something to work for that connects to this life. We just sang about it. The hope that's laid up for you in heaven. And of this you have heard before. It's transforming them. The meta story is my story and our stories of life transformation. It's the little stories that we tell that demonstrate the transforming power of God in our lives. That's the meta story. It's not simply a story about me. It, uh, the, the meta story is not just about how I think and how I feel and things that happen to me, but it's the story of how I am being transformed, how I am becoming someone different and something different that God is doing in and through me. Now, the other part of story and the reason we we say these relationships tell stories, plural, is because there's not just the meta story, but there's a macro story that we see here in this passage as, as well. The macro story is the gospel or good news. 
That's literally what the word gospel means. It means good news. There was good news that the appearance of Jesus on this earth, he was bringing a message of good news. The forgiveness of sins. The inauguration of the kingdom of God on this earth. And that's the macro story, the grace of God being revealed and made known, manifest through Jesus Christ. Now, what I want you to notice in the passage, though, is how the macro story, the good news, the gospel, forms and shapes the meta story of our lives. And as we experience life transformation... In a cyclical fashion, we become part of telling the macro story, the good news of Jesus Christ. Do you see the cyclical nature? They heard the good news of the gospel, the forgiveness of sins, the kingdom of God that transcends all understanding. The hope, the forgiveness the faith and the love, and and, and it produces something in them. It wasn't just facts and information, but it, in this cyclical fashion, as they hear and begin to understand it, it changes them. And it gives them a story. And then their story begins to tell that gospel story all over again. This is essentially what the Bible is. You know, we, we, we treat the Bible and we look at it kind of as a book. But the reality is it's a collection. It's a, a book of what? Of 66 individual books. See, it's a macro story that's made up of meta stories. And these little meta stories, though, tie together and feed and tell this big story of what God is doing. In fact, you, you, you can kind of sum up the Bible in a nutshell and basically this way, that that, that the Bible tells a story of creation and fall. God created and he created all things good, but then there's this fall, there's this, this fall from all things good and things aren't all good anymore. But then it leads into the story of redemption, of God reclaiming what has fallen, and redeeming and renewing that which has fallen and become not so good. And then it leads to a story of recreation. As the story that we read here comes to an end, it hints at this recreation that one day God is going to recreate the heavens and the earth. And then it sort of ends and leaves us hanging and anticipating That day. Now, it's recreation, not recreation. Got it? Okay. Recreation. That God is making a new heavens and a new earth. And that's the story. But the story is made up of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meta stories that form this big story of who God is and what God is doing in our worlds. And the last thing that I want us to see this morning is this. These stories point toward God above all. These stories point toward God above all. That's the theme. Above all is the theme of our study of Colossians for the next couple of months. Look Go back to the the first thing that Paul says following his basic introductory greeting. In verse 3, We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you all since we heard of your faith. We've heard what God has done among you. We've heard the stories, but notice, he doesn't just go and start praising and bragging on them when he hears the story of what's going on among them, what's his response? We give thanks to God. 
That's interesting. The word that we almost always translate thanksgiving is the word Eucharistos. For those of you who maybe have a different background than Baptist, you've heard of the Eucharist, which is the celebration of the Lord's table or communion. It means showing grace. Thanksgiving is really just giving grace and honor back. We've been graced through what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, and we give that grace back. That's what Thanksgiving is, is giving honor, showing honor back for what God has done. When Paul hears of the life transformation that's taking place among them, which is really just a response to what God has, they, their discovery of what God has done for them, the natural and ultimate response is thanksgiving. Praise, honor, and thanksgiving to God. It's not directed toward them, but toward God when he thinks of them. He thinks about them. He sees them. He hears about what's going on in them, but his praise ultimately points to God. In his book, Practice Resurrection, one of my favorite authors, Eugene Peterson, writes, writes this. So why church? One of my other favorite authors, Philip Yancey, wrote a number of years ago a, a little book that I love, Why Bother with Church? Peterson asked the rhetorical question, so why church? And he says this, the short answer is because the Holy Spirit formed it to be a colony of heaven in the country of death. Now, I'm going to read on the quote, but we need to kind of hold on to that for a minute. It's kind of what Melissa was talking about and what we were singing about a while, while ago. Because the church is a colony planted from heaven in a country of death. It's who we are. It's what God is doing. It means that everything around us is not always good. It means that the country that we live in is not always good. The world that we live in is not always good. But notice what he says. Because the Holy Spirit formed it to be a colony of heaven in the country of death. Church is the core element in the strategy of the Holy Spirit for providing human witness and physical presence to the Jesus-inaugurated kingdom of God in this world. It is not that kingdom complete, but it is a witness to that kingdom. That's what we are. And I would argue this, that if the church is not that, then it has no business being in business. If the church is not that, then it has no business being in business. A colony of heaven in a country of death. That's who and what we are. The story of the transformation, the influence that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, his forgiveness, his kingdom, what it does in us, shapes us and changes the way that we live so that our lives tell that story over and over again, bringing faith and love and hope into a country of death and decay and maybe people, individuals, and communities that feel like they've been bypassed or forgotten bringing life out of death. That's who we are. It's what God calls us to be. It's our reason for existence. It's our reason for gathering together. 
to be a colony of heaven in a country of death. So kind of as we put this together this morning, I want to invite the band to, to go ahead and come on back up. Kind of looking at these three things, I want us to ask ourselves a few questions. One, when we come back to the first thing that we talked about, the importance of the we, the importance of community, the importance of, of the fact that, that the church is and, and the whole Christian thing is relational in nature, means that we have to ask the, the, the question. Look, I, I realize getting connected is kind of a difficult thing right now. It's not normal. It's not, it's not easy. The fact is, it's never easy. Relationships, I don't care what. I don't care what format, what context they take place in. Relationships are never, ever, ever easy. They always take work. Now we've got a little bit of different wrench thrown in that makes them a little bit more difficult, but they are still possible and they are still absolutely essential and necessary. So I got to ask you, who are you doing faith with? Who are you walking with? Because it's always a we thing. It's never just a me and Jesus, me on my own, Lone Ranger sort of thing. Who are you doing faith with? Secondly, what's God doing in and through you in this season of life? That's the meta story that we talked about. Can you identify at least one area where you can see God at work in you? Maybe the way you relate to people, maybe a thousand different things that it could be. But can you identify at least one area in your life where the good news message of Jesus is bringing a transformation to who you are? Or maybe another way we need to, to, to ask it or ask ourselves this question is this. Is there something that's keeping you or me from growing in our faith? Or is there something that's keeping us from seeing what God is doing? Is there a barrier that maybe we need to get rid of that's keeping us from allowing God to work or keeping us from seeing what God is actually up to all around us? And lastly, pertaining to the last question, I just want us to ask this simple little question. How's your life pointing people toward God? Above all. Above all else, how is your life pointing people toward God? God? Is there evidence of a growing faith, love, and hope in you that other people would see what's going on in you and be directed to and thank God? Let's pray together. God, thank you that you brought heaven to earth. that you invaded this country of death, this world of death and decay and frustration and futility, that you invaded it with your presence, that you became one of us, that you descended from heaven, that you made yourself fully known, that you became fully present to us. began a process of redeeming us, of establishing your kingdom and your presence on this earth. God, we, we thank you for that. May that truth and that reality birth seeds in our heart that take root and sprout 
and grow and produce fruit. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up.